All right, welcome everyone to the next session. So uh, we're honored to have uh, Gur Bittand, from, who's the CTO of Mantis Vision, one of the leading companies building 3D depth sensor technology. He's going to give us an overview of uh, 3D depth sensors and what they're good for. Thank you, Neil. Uh, well, as mentioned, my name is Gur Yabitan. I'm from Mantis Vision in Israel. And I've been working for the last 10 years making high quality, accurate 3D sensing available into mass market, basically mobile. This talk about is all uh, about mobile depth technologies and knowing what type are there and what are the pros and cons for each. And well, it says, fact, 3D is here. Uh, I think the major awareness become as Microsoft brought the PrimeSense device, uh, the Kinect one, and the next trend is taking it into mobile. Um, as any, any mobile application uh, is the key in terms of uh, no matter what you put in hardware, the one thing that drives mobile are applications, and I believe mostly that content creation is the major key making that. Now, there are many uh, use cases discussed. Some of them have been demonstrated here by Johnny. Uh, some have been talked and hyped for many years as well. Augmented reality, either large scale or small scale on desk. Um, all the gestures, tracking, which is well known from the days of the Kinect. Um, facial tracking, live facial tracking to, live, live, to support live puppeteering of avatars, either as gaming or uh, 3D video conferencing when you can put any, any character you wish. Um, all the scanning modes, either for 3D printings or taking the models to somewhere else. Computational photography, robotics, and I think the most trivial one is basically capture live events that you happen in your life and just share, with, share them in the social media. I know uh, I'm working with the 3D technology as a developer from the first days, and I was capturing my daughter making her first calling on the, on the floor, getting to her mom. And I think that uh, sometimes the most trivial ones are the, most, uh, the ones that will get there uh, as soon as possible. And of course, the killer apps is yet to be found. Uh, and there are many killer apps that we don't know or not aware of. And basically, people around here will find new, new use cases if it's going to be crowdsourcing for modeling or some kind of uh, new dating mechanism. Who knows? Well, every technology has its limits and pros, and I think that in order to have a real freedom of operation, um, one must understand the constraints of each technology to be free within these constraints, and I think that this talk will basically be about that. Um, there are two major uh, technologies for depth sensing. One of them is time of flight, and the second is triangulation. Um, time of flight, if you're familiar with the companies, uh, the new Xbox One, the Soft Kinetic, and the PMD Tech uh, has been using. And triangulation has been used for stereo, passive, or active, like the Kinect 360. We are an active, active triangulation mechanism as well. So how does it work? As the name implies, time of flight is a method uh, capturing the measuring the time of flight of the duration since you have a mythic source and up to the point that it's reflected back to the camera. And because the speed of light is constant, you can tell the distance by knowing that. But the problem is it's, the speed of light is quite fast. If you're talking about a two and a half meters distance object, you're talking about 16.7 uh, uh, nanoseconds for making the five meters distance going there, which means if you want to go to high resolution, if you're going to be a millimeter resolution, you need uh, picosecond cameras. And it seems to be that though there are amazing stuff happened in picosecond, picosecond cameras, and I've seen many also in the labs, uh, taking even things that are beyond direct uh, eyesight, uh, it's not yet there in mobile. Uh, what has been used mostly is another form of time of light, which is uh, phase detection. Instead of pulsing the light, 
the light is transmitted constantly, but it's modulated in a high frequency, usually 20, 30 megahertz. And what has been uh, looking at is the phase difference that correlates to the distance change. Well, it works well. It works well, it works rather robust. Every pixel generates depth information, and the quality, if you're looking for looking the face and the hand, is great. But one secret, if you want to know the depth quality, you always have to change your perspective. And this is uh, one of the drawbacks of this kind of mechanism. Speed of light is quite fast, and as doing that, the amount of noise is very high. So it's robust, it's very low latency, low computation, but the noise is high. Even the state-of-the-art solution as the Kinect One, which is by far, far from being a mobile device, has noise issues, but is trying to be overcoming that by using high amount of averaging, high amount of noise, denoising. So you can see it if you're looking at certain features as if you look at the hands when approached, you'll see that you have some kind of something in between the, hand, the hands. Some of these artifacts are due to a high amount of denoising. So just to sum it up on time of flight, the pros, it's direct measurement per pixel, it's very robust, very low computation, very low latency. If you need latency and latency is a factor, there's no doubt that time of flight is the best solution to work with. Uh, the cons, quality of the data in terms of noise is quite high and different kind of noise. Uh, it's also some kind of bias to uh, edges and angles and some sort of reflective materials and also, one of the things that, that absolute dimensions are not preserved well. So if you're looking to do a modeling from different perspectives, you need to somehow compensate for these deviations. Well, second method is the method we use. We have two eyes, and our brain corresponds what we see in between the two perspectives. And the idea is quite simple. We have a feature looking at one point, feature looking at one point, so as long as we can match these features, we have a triangle in space. This triangle in space allows us to know the distance by knowing this position and finding the angles. Well, every triangulation system requires three things. The baseline, which has a linear impact on the accuracy. The correspondence, to find which feature is which, and this is the major challenge looking at um, triangulation, and the localization that basically defines the quality of this depth, qual depth resolution. And this is the issue. When looking at passive solution, uh, you might have the best camera in the world, you might have the best algorithm in the world. Sometimes you just don't have features in the environment. Um, so if you're looking at um, depth sensing and you have a wall, if you have elements that don't have highly textured environment, it's difficult to get that just by getting correspondence on an image. There are three types of passive um, depth sensing. Uh, the one that we talked is stereo. And the advantage is, of course, it's passive. You don't need to emit any light to it. Um, another approach is multi-aperture. Multi-aperture is like you're seeing here is using multiple sensors with lower resolution. Uh, it's more robust as you have more frames to correspond to and the localization can be improved. Uh, it has one major drawback and this is that the depth quality, as we discussed, has a linear um, correlation to the baseline. And when you have a five millimeter baseline between each camera, it's difficult to get high quality depth from a certain distance. So this is used mostly, I don't think that the depth is the major key factor for that, is the computational photography that's been used. Taking that to produce a very good 2D image that you can refocus after and do other stuff, types of computational photography. Um, the third use case is the one that everybody can use in cell phone already, is basically taking whatever you have as a major back camera and using a software to upload all the frames on the high resolution 8 megs or 13 megs images to the cloud and find uh, correspondence without the limits of a mobile constraint. 
and it works only for static. It's a bit more uh, complicated capture process. You have to be making sure you know where you are and what you do. Uh, but you have major advantage. You have a great baseline. Every two perspectives that have overlap are a new baseline instead of having that on a device itself. Well, all of these are great, and all of these suffer from the main, main one is that it's highly texture dependent. Some cases it will work, some cases it won't. Well, one way to approach that is replacing one camera with a coded light source, just like in the image here. You can just take a coded light source, like we have here, and basically embed the correspondence inside the image by projecting it. Well, if you have embedded features in the environment, the next thing is to know which feature is which. You have here multiple points, and you still need to find out um, which point I'm seeing here from what point on the projector or the mask it's been, been out to. Uh, comparing these has about three major uh, methods. One is doing it by time multiplex, changing the frames that projected over time, and assuming that as long as I can integrate it over time and nothing moves, everything is okay. It's not that the case for mobile. And next thing is finding a unique cluster of points. So instead of looking for correspondent feature, you're looking for correspondent cluster. It's done very well with the Kinect 360. And there is also another kind of coding method, as we have, uh, which call it bidimensional epipolar coding, which is much denser. When we say denser, I would like to explain about what it is. If you're comparing the images, they not look alike. But if we'll take the same image, this is a phone I captured just in the hotel room uh, with a Kinect code, Kinect 360 on it, and the same thing with the code we project to it. And here I'm painting the um, critical features that we can find localization in space and generate a point cloud from each localization. It's difficult to see it at that resolution, so I'll zoom in. And as you might see, we have here a way to localize the white points, the black points, and also the connected points in between them. So if we'll zoom and compare that to a connect signal before, you see that we are much more dense in our real reading and a way to localize this. If we look just on one part of, it, part of it, you can see the difference on the left. You can see actually much more dense. So if just looking at numbers and the same area surrounded here, we have 280 critical features in this image. And with the Kinect 360, you have 40 white points. It's funny because the Kinect, instead of getting that as uh, 40, it gives you 600 points on that part because it highly extrapolates all, everything that's in between. So when I'm saying extrapolates, it means that all this region that you don't have any localization on information for can be achieved by that. So what the price? The price is basically you have a very, you have diff error that only can be managed by averaging over time. So if you average that over time and take the time, after 10 frames, you have something that is quite fluent and clean. But it means that you have to take much more time to do that. As I'm limited in time, I might be proceeding even further away um, I just want to show and the same thing. And we take that now and we'll do, this is the results from a Kinect after averaging on the best qualities possible. And what we'll do now, we'll show a similar flow without doing any denoising, just taking the row point cloud on the same scene. So no averaging, no denoising. This is the row of point clouds aggregated over time. If you can see, the features are uh, out there. They are not being blended in ways that happening when you blend. 
depth information. Time of flight can be also using some kind of blending and denoising mechanism. Uh, of course, it can't really get to you whatever is beyond the noise level, but still can be useful to do um, low resolution scanning as well. Um, I think I'll just go move fast forward if comparing the standard deviation of a system, uh, professional version, uh, which we call F5, is uh, giving an amazing result in terms of uh, noise level. It, uh, say at four and a half meters, you're going to the five millimeters standard deviation. That compares to about 10 times more on a Kinect and a bit less now on our consumer, uh, consumer product. But if you're living in a two and a half meters distance, you're still getting a very high quality, even with, com with commercialized consumer, consumer as well elements. Um, to sum it, sum it up, uh, time of flight, mobile is great for user interaction. It's lower, uh, the, 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 it's less relevant when going into higher details, especially if you need motion and detail together, which is very limiting. Um, shape for motion, having a very strong use case of capturing static elements over time. And um, active source, are the ones that basically give you also the ability to get to high quality um, modeling, either dynamic or static, and also some of the other use cases. Um, we are here to say that we already ported our code to the Tega K1. Uh, so GiveTech will talk after, after us, we'll, we're doing a part, big part of the job. Um, we are working very hard to finalize some use cases we put our efforts in. And on June 2014, we'll be starting to give preference SDKs so people can start before the devices will come. We're working with all the ecosystem to put devices into the market. Um, we believe that it'll be by the end of the year, the beginning of next year, it will come. And just because show the demonstration, but I haven't shown too much samples data. So after joining the event, I would like to show just some comparable results. This is done at 2010. Going down the stairs of our old offices. It took me 60 seconds going from flow four to minus one. And then another 30 seconds to capture the baseline. So all of that was, done, all that was done in one shot. And of course the coverage allow you to get into detail and in small parts. It doesn't have to be regular window environment. It can also be some more outdoor scenes. Uh, this is a case when you can go into a house which has entrance for a tunnel. One end is closed, the second is open, and basically I was crawling down there, capturing the environment. And just to have a scale, a sense of scale, This is the size I was working on. So the exterior and the interior were done with the same system. There's no different kind of system, different, different kind of setups. Um, just to show the operation, this is the professional version. One thing, the big one here is now equal to this one. And this was an actual car accident happened outside of our office. I got down very fast. Every frame we capture, generate a depth image. Now we have about four times more denser image from the same, so, from the same source. And just by getting the data, we can get very dense, high, accurate depth sensing without doing any averaging to get to this kind of level of detail. Well, I 
think this is it. If you have any questions, if there is time for questions, yes, we have, yes, to we have time for some questions. So does, does anyone have questions? Yes, you have a rendering. I think it's a rendering. I'm not sure of the pocket. In you had a. No, it's not a rendering. It's okay. in here. Could could we see that? Basically, it's working. It's okay. been demonstrated for at least four months. Can you demo that? There's no I don't think we have the time for doing that. Okay, there's no videos or anything. Um, you can talk with me after the, the lecture. I'll be able to show you some stuff. How much, what's your overhead for processing power to be able to process all that uh, data? Um, first iteration running on the, I'm saying Logan, but it's basically Tega K1, uh, runs at 50 frames per second and uh, mostly utilizing just, just the GPUs. Um, there isn't much use to go to 50 frames per second. You just need more, much less than that. And this is beyond, before going to further optimization. I would say this is the first cycle of operation. Uh, any limitation, for example, like uh, uh, hair, mirror, all those kind of materials? Well, uh, it's a receiving transmitting system, transmitting receiving systems. So I might have a good example for mirror. Uh, mirror basically just show you Alice in, uh, Alice in Mirrorland. Whatever is in the mirror is in the other side of the room. And this works very well. If you have something that is transparent, it's difficult to get there. Though we do handle hair as long as it's not too curly. be fast. No, 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 not bad. <laughs> so this is my partner, Amichai. We've been in the, after a meeting when I've been asked the same question, and I said, of course, we can capture through mirrors. And he said, how come you say that? And I said, because it should work. He told me, prove it. So uh, you can get that in some cases, uh, just even from a 2D camera, but you can never get that from a 2D <laughs> camera. Yeah. Um, question on the outdoor examples. What's, what's the range you can get for depth? Um, that depends on system properties. Um, this was built uh, from thinking that two and a half meters is the max distance required to capture a full body experience in motion. Uh, we extended that also to work at four and four and a half meters. Our professional version goes even beyond that in, in daylight, in direct sunlight. Uh, so, um, as we talked a lot about the ecosystem, new sensor arrives, uh, new computational power arrives. We believe in terms of spec, we're just moving much forward. And every day it comes in, I can think of next generation device that we utilize some of the new stuff that's coming around. Okay, one last question. Um, so having worked a lot with the Microsoft Kinect and the Prems and sensors, um, I realized that there's, um, you, need, um, you need some uh, calibration mechanism in order to have it work correctly. Um, does the Mantis Vision require um, calibration? Does it go out of calibration once you have it calibrated? And how do you do, do you do any temperature compensation? And uh, if yes, how do you do it? I'd say that 40% of our um, algorithm efforts was to make that a uh, non-issue. Uh, this was calibrated last year, before the end of last year. It's been with me uh, at least seven flights since then, dropped several, several times on the floor and still functioning live without having, needing to calibrate. But we do have a calibration layer. First of all, we track if the system goes out of calibration by the decoding process. And we do have calibration methods to recalibrate the system either on the fly automatically or higher with some kind of user assistance. Okay, cool. Thank you, that was a great presentation. Thank you. Thank you.